Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Mormon Stories Podcast. I'm your host, John DeLynn. It is March 27th, 2018, and we are very excited for today's interview. Um, we are going to be interviewing a successful, well-known uh, documentary, award-winning documentary filmmaker, Tyler Meesom. Uh, so Tyler has been on Mormon Stories at least once before, uh, way, way many years ago, uh, Tyler released what I th- what I think of as his first major documentary film, uh, which was called Sons of Perdition, which featured uh, the Lost Boys of the FLDS Church down in uh, the Crick. And so some of you will know Tyler Meesom from that interview, those of you who are real Mormon Stories geeks. Um, Tyler followed up that movie with another award-winning movie called An Honest Liar, uh, which is available on Netflix uh, it's about the amazing Randy, uh, this incredibly brilliant uh, sort of magician who became a debunker of charlatans, you know, faith healers, etc. in the in the 80s. Uh, it's an amazing film. And then uh, Tyler also won, I think, a, a, a Emmy for his work on a documentary called Beehive Spirits. And um, he's currently working on a documentary about MTV, uh, and he is going to be, he's currently uh, in development on a super secret, super special documentary that all of you are going to want to hear about, but we're going to tease it now and just say, stay to the end of this interview because you will want to hear about uh, his his next Mormon-themed documentary film. But Tyler is not only, uh, in my mind, you know, one of the uh, most successful award-winning documentary filmmakers, you know, in or out of sort of, let's just say Utah slash Mormonism, post-Mormon. He's also just a great human and uh, a real dear friend. So the theme of today or the sort of plot or timeline of today is just going to be Tyler's story. We're going to talk about his uh, his growing up uh, in Mormonism, uh, his journey uh, as a Mormon, and then we're going to talk about what led to him becoming uh, a filmmaker and specifically a documentary filmmaker. And then we'll talk about each of the major documentaries that he's created, uh, his approach to filmmaking, his philosophy about filmmaking, why he does it, what he tries to do, um, how you break into the business and how you be successful at it, uh, how you get fabulously wealthy. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, being, we'll talk about that as well, whether or not you should become a documentary filmmaker for the money. And then we'll end by talking about uh, Tyler's uh, new project that's top secret, but we're going to talk about it today on Mormon Stories for a Great Reveal. So without any further ado, Tyler Meesom, welcome back to Mormon Stories Podcast. Thanks, John. It has been a long time. I think it was, what was it 2006, maybe, when we did that interview? 2008? Yeah, something like, like that. that. Yeah. It was on your couch. You were still in Logan. And I think Jenny came. Was it she Jenny? Did. Yeah, what the co-director, Jenny Lynn Merton. You just basically had like a handheld little like Radio <laughs> Shack mic. This is a full-on <laughs> setup here. Look at you, all advanced and technology. Yeah. It was great. Well, shout out to my, you know, our donors to the Open Stories Foundation. We have been able to invest in new lighting equipment, new microphones, new cameras, new uh, streaming equipment. So we... We're beefing up Mormon Story Studios here in downtown Salt Lake City, thanks to our donors. So we we hope you guys enjoy the higher video and audio quality. And anyway, it's just fun to have you here. No, well, I you know uh, obviously I've known you for years and we've been friends. Uh, it's nice to actually officially be on the show, other than I was before. But but also like I, I can't tell you how many people tell me that you've made such a difference in their life. Really, I mean it's. You, you really have done good with what you're doing, and you've, uh, you've really affected a lot of people's uh, outcomes and livelihoods, and um, uh, you've, you know, it's grandiose, but in many ways you've saved a lot of lives. So to be a part of it uh, and to know you is a pleasure. Well, thank you. Thanks, Tyler. Uh, quick shout out to all of our Facebook Live listeners. It's really great to have people joining us live. Uh, we really do that to make this interview more interactive. Uh, many of you are going to have questions or comments uh, or even perspective that you want to share. So uh, please feel free to write comments and questions in the, in the Facebook live stream, and I will do my best to incorporate those. 
So uh, shout out to our, our live listeners and to our asynchronous listeners and viewers who are going to watch us later on, on Facebook or, or YouTube or just listening to us the good old-fashioned, old-school way of, of downloading the MP3 on iTunes or on Android and listening that way. Welcome to everybody. Uh, so thanks for the kind words, Tyler. Of course. Uh, I do have a cold. I'm just uh, I'm on the tail end of a cold that just keeps hanging around like some unwanted relative. Man, it's just been brutal for me. So forgive me if I cough or if I'm a little raspy. No, it adds to the grit. Does it adds it? to the grit and the drama <laughs> so, yes. of what we're trying to do. Yes, the real life yeah. wounded man. <laughs> so Tyler, let's begin as we always do. Tell us about your your Mormon upbringing and to what extent... Mormonism was or wasn't a part of your childhood and adolescence, how it was important, how it was helpful, how it might have not been so helpful? That's a, yeah, <laughs> that's a big question. Um, <clears throat> whenever you go on a plane or anything and you, you, you sit next to somebody, and I, I travel quite a bit, and you always say, oh, where are you from? And you guys know, anyone's listening, uh, when you sit next to someone and they say, where are you from? And I say, Utah. You know the first thing they ask. You no, know, the first thing they say isn't, are you a Mormon? That's the second thing they say. The first thing they say is, is Utah. They always respond like, Utah? Like, like you just said Venus. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, then they say, well, are you Mormon? And then, you know, I have to regale people with kind of my upbringing. So this is old, old hat for me. Um, so yeah, I was, uh, I was uh, for the most part, raised in Utah. Early, I was raised in uh, California. Uh, outside of San Jose in a place called Melpitas. And my parents were originally from Utah, Spanish Fork. They met, long line of Mormonisms, all the way back to, goodness, I don't even know, cross the plains, uh, polygamy in my background. Um, my parents, of course, active Mormons, <clears throat> lived in California. And then when I was 12, we moved to Pleasant Grove, Utah, which at the time, and that was... Is that 82, 84, 84? Uh, it was a much smaller town than it is right now, Pleasant Grove. So we lived out in Manila. Uh, it was very idyllic, very nice, big yard, trees and fields and apple orchards. And yes, I was raised uh, uh, LDS. Um, five sisters, one brother, and we had a big, happy Mormon family. <clears throat> now, I... Uh, you know, I took to it for the most part because that's just what you did. I just kind of believed in it and knew and thought that it was right. And I remember not necessarily questioning it. <clears throat> I will say this. I, uh, I had just a bored going to church. I just I hated going to church. In fact, I remember being a kid and going. We would go to church. My mother would just make me go to church. And sometimes I would literally sneak out and go hide in the bushes and just sit hidden in the bushes for three hours. I'd rather sit in the bushes for three hours. But I, you know, I, I enjoyed church and I enjoyed people and I enjoyed uh, learning about it. And for the most part, it's all I knew, as many of the people who were raised in the state of Utah and, uh, are aware of. I was basically just a sheltered little Mormon boy, didn't really know. I thought Mormonism was basically everything. <clears throat> I thought it was what people did, and I thought everyone who, you know, I, I, don't, I remember not even really seeing any other uh, churches. So I really didn't even know anything to the uh, opposite of it. But I had a really good childhood, and I was, for the most part, a pretty good kid. I was a bit rowdy, uh, a bit rebellious, did a little bit of drinking in high school, but by and large, I was a good little Mormon boy. A uh, nice little virgin and went on a Mormon mission at the age of 19 and um, was pretty happy to do so. I mean, it was just what you were expected to do as a, as a young lad growing up as a Mormon boy. I didn't really know why. I didn't really understand much about it, but that's just what you did. So people would ask, well, what are you doing after high school? And I go, well, I'm going to go on a mission. I'm going to go on a mission. I'm going to go on a mission. And it's kind of strange because I never really, <clears throat> you, you, there's an element where you don't think past that, you know, you just go like, this is when I'm going to graduate, I'm going to go on a Mormon mission, and then we'll see what happens after that. So you kind of plan and prepare for that. And uh, um, I went to Missouri Independence. Whoa. Yeah, right there in the heartland. <clears throat> um, you know, it uh, covered a lot of Nebraska. 
It's like Mormon <laughs> Zion. Iowa. That's Mormon Zion, right? It is. It is. Yeah. Or, a lot of Kansas, a lot of Iowa, a lot of Nebraska. Um, so yeah, I mean, it was a, it was a good event. I don't know if you want me to go into that. Well, was there anything important about your mission experience that you see as formative to kind of your your journey and your path? <clears throat> Look, Mormon missions are are quite strange, and I'm probably speaking to many individuals who have been on them, so I don't really need to explain it necessarily, but it is a very odd occurrence that you take these young boys and girls, boys and girls who should be, uh, for all intents and purposes, in college, you know, learning, I mean, that is the formative years of your intellectual growth. When you're out of your home and you're 18 or 19 and you're experimenting and you're coming onto kind of that transition stage between being a stupid ass kid and being an adult. And, you know, there's such a, 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 a I had this, even though I was sent to Kansas and even though I was um, on a Mormon mission, I had this like thirst for knowledge that I'd never really had before, even though, you know, I was a decent student and I read a great deal. We were definitely raised, <clears throat> my parents raised us with a, 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 you know, a hunger for knowledge and uh, reading and culture and music and art was very important, even though we were this small town, you know, large family. It was very important to be well-educated and well-versed and well-spoken. Um, you know, sisters are valedictorians and athletic scholarships, and I was the st artist, you know. that. Um, but when I went on my mission, I really had this knowledge or thirst for, for knowledge. And you're, you're kind of stuck in a, in a strange sense. And next thing you know, you're, you're with a, a person whom you had no choice being with. And you're in a place where you, I mean, I was in my first area I was in, <clears throat> I don't even remember, some small town in Nebraska, Nebraska city. And I was stuck with this, uh, Austrian guy. He was an Austrian officer in the Austrian army and he was very strict. He was just very by the books. And the books are you wake up at 630 and you study and you're out the door at nine and then you don't come back until like eight or something. I don't remember the exact, you know, the white Bible guidelines. But I remember we were just letter of the law. Just I was just thrown into this. And here I was just a kid who was a, you know, kind of a kooky artist and wanted to be a I wanted to do comic strips was initially what I wanted to do. And I wanted to be a filmmaker. And all of a sudden I'm thrown into this rigid world where I'm wearing a tie and I'm hanging out and it's freezing cold in Nebraska. And I remember one day we're walking home and we'd been walking all day <laughs> and we're just like, you know, walking and talking to people and wouldn't go back and it was freezing cold. And we got back to the apartment and it was, I think you, ha you had to be out until like eight or something or nine. I don't remember, but it was like, 851 and I just started walking in because it was freezing and I was tired and the guy goes I'm staying out here we're not supposed to go in until nine and I just I, I, I was even though I was just a greenie I went that's stupid man I'm going inside it's freezing and I went inside and watched him as he just stood outside until the clock hit nine o'clock and he went in and just that odd letter of the law. I, I never quite grasped that nature. Another example is we had this mission president and, you know, there was a, there was a, a mission president and his wife, you know, the, the mission president's wife uh, is kind of has the duty of like a first lady, you know, where they have these cute little roles where they're supposed to take care of something. And, and her job was uh, um, missionary safety. And I recall we had this big zone conference and everyone was there, hundreds of missionaries. And we'd had a number of accidents in the mission vehicles. And so she got up and she was giving us things you have to do. And she said, she said, what's the distance you have to stay from the car in front of you? And, uh, and you know, I think people are like four seconds, two seconds, or whatever. And she goes, 12 seconds. And I just remember this audible gasp in the crowd, like, no. I mean, it was like, no, no, you can't, no. And, it, you know, that's ludicrous. You can't be 12 seconds away from the car in front of you. That's utterly dangerous. And she said, yes, she said, yes. 
And then I remember the mission president got up after and she said, and he just scolded us. And he said, you have been commanded. You have been told that it's 12 seconds and you will be 12 seconds away from the car in front of you. And I just thought that is impossible and utterly unsafe. So even though I was, I was a missionary and I did believe in it, and I wholly believed in it, I, I wanted to believe in it, it's what I knew, I just always kind of fought that um, strict, this is how it should be, and it's unwielding attitude uh, that I think kind of permeated it in a sense. We had this very strict mission president who was like, you, you dress the right way, and you, it, it was like a business. It was like this baptizing business uh, where it was all about numbers and it was all about like this, it just felt like it was Gordon Gecko-esque kind of Wall Street attitude and atmosphere where everyone was just trying to kiss the corporate hierarchy and I just kind of fought against it in many ways. Hmm. <clears throat> so um, did you leave your mission with your testimony intact or... Was that a death blow to your testimony? Now, mind you, I was a, I was a good missionary. In fact, it, it, I will I will without question say that my mission was a, a a a very important part of me being a filmmaker and me being an artist in many many ways. And I think what I did and what I did very differently is I, you know, they had this like you're supposed to knock on doors and you know you're supposed to go and knock on a door and try and teach people on the other side. And they had this, you're supposed to challenge someone to be baptized in the first or second discussion. And for me, I just, I couldn't imagine asking another human being to change their way of life, to give up coffee or, or, or any other vice they may have. Oh, excuse me. Um, after I met him for two days, like how, the bravado I thought that it would take to do that. So as soon as I became a... <clears throat> A senior companion and had you know the option I just didn't I didn't follow those rules I I opted instead to I didn't want to go approach strangers I thought that's how terrible is that to just go up to a guy walking in the street or someone who's obviously home watching mash and I'm knocking on the door and I'm gonna to talk to him about religion uh, so I would I would look through the records of old people who um, you know, missionaries had talked to before. And I would just go over and I'd be their friend. I'd just chat, I'd hang out, I'd shoot hoops with their kids, I'd do magic tricks. I wouldn't bring up religion at all. Just chat with them, have a great time. And then I'd come back the next time and I'd lightly say something like, hey, I should teach you a little bit about stuff. And then uh, slowly I would eventually kind of uh, give them the lessons. And mind you, I was a good salesman. I was very good at it. I was able to kind of communicate to these people effectively. But by that time, I'd kind of become their friend um, and, and, you know, been able to, you know, kind of uh, care more about them than a number, which was previously what most other missionaries would do, is just this churn them out and baptize them really quickly. So, yeah, I, 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 uh, I, I learned a great deal about that and, 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 you know, moving forward a little bit, which is uh, what I do is create stories. And the majority of what I do as a documentary filmmaker is to build a relationship of trust. And I know we've heard that story if we've been on a mission with the person with whom I'm sitting across. Um, I am trying to get an individual to tell me their story. And it may be the simple story of you know, their music videos on MTV or an incident that occurred 30 years ago or their heartbreaking life journey. And so that's what my Mormon mission really taught me was the, uh, the ability to, uh, to empathize with an individual and to care about an individual quickly. And I think I learned that only because of the antithesis of what I saw, which was Mormon missionaries just going in with this hellfire, I'm going to baptize you and I need to get my numbers up. Um, you know, we had the highest baptizing mission in the country. And there was always this battle between Salt Lake and Independence, Missouri mission. And it just felt like numbers. And I kind of went against that. So, yes, I came home with, uh, with a full on testimony, of course, for the most part. I was a rowdy missionary. I had a good time. I, I think one thing that was interesting is 
um, how uh, how different being on a mission was from the thought of what I thought a mission would be. You know, I thought these perfect kids, baptizing, preaching. I mean, I back to what I was saying about my thirst for knowledge. I I dare say I gained an appreciation for literature on my mission because man, I got tired of reading that same book over and over and over and over. And I remember being able to, I, I found a book in an apartment and it was like hidden in a closet and I just couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't believe I could read another book and I read it and it was a terrible novel. I can't even remember what it was. I can't, I remember vividly how bad it was, but I was so excited to just read anything that didn't have the word verily in it, <laughs> you know, or it shall come to pass. And I read so many books on my mission. I would just go buy books or I, we'd go to thrift stores and I'd find books and I just fell in love with literature and I, I would read Updike and I read a lot of Louis L'Amour and I read, <laughs> I, I read so much. Western. Yeah. Well, uh, he's last of the breed right? was always oh, so great. Um, but I read a lot of really great classic literature and Catcher in the Rye and, and Fahrenheit 451 and, and things that, uh, you know, kids my age when they're in college read. Uh, That's kind of contraband. Like, were your companions freaking out that you were reading anything other than Jesus the Christ, <laughs> Articles of Faith, Miracle of Forgiveness, and a Marvelous Work in a Wonder? <laughs> I, was a, I was a rather persuasive person, John. Okay. <laughs> you know? You were uh, trouble from the beginning. Yeah, I kind of, yeah. But the thing is, I always baptize, and I baptize good people. So, so you I, had some success. Yeah, but I was, I was a bit of a, 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 I had a lot of fun. Let's just say that. You know, I, I definitely um, had fun with some people, and I learned a great deal. And did I watch movies? Damn right I did. In fact, I watched a lot of movies on my mission, and I really did appreciate uh, literature and art and culture. And I remember on P days when my mission companions wanted to go play basketball, which I, I, I'm an athlete, so, but I wanted to go to art museums and I wanted to go to places that, you know, historical places. So, I, I mean, my mission really in many ways, the rigidity that was in set within the mission rules um, made me go the opposite direction and it grew my uh, my culture and my knowledge and my um, my appreciation for things that uh, for the su subversive in some ways. So which which came first, your desire and commitment to be a filmmaker, or your sort of let's just say faith transition? Which began first? Well, I uh, I wanted to be a filmmaker when I was a kid, nine years old. So talk about the early influences, whether it's people you met or movies you saw that made you think about filmmaking so early? Well, I was, uh, you know, I was always drawn to the artistic. I was quite an artist and I, I, I was very interested in art. Um, you know, if, if there is one thing to be said about the Mormon environment, the Mormon, Mormon culture is that it, it, for it being a, a rather conservative religion, they are uh, appreciative of the arts, music, dance, literature, movies, unless they're R-rated, uh, you know, so I, I, in many ways, I was embraced in that a a aspect. Um, but I was nine years old, uh, and my aunt took me to see Indiana Jones and Raiders of the Lost Ark. And uh, I was just mesmerized by it. And uh, the face melting was that the thing? <laughs> what, what was the. I, you know, just the whole. Was there... I was in it, and I was there with, with Indiana Jones, and, and just that feeling that. Uh, stayed with me after that movie, uh, you know, and I've heard, had some people like Indiana Jones, like you're supposed to say Casablanca, like I'm so, Indiana Jones is a great movie. And it, you know, when you're a nine year old kid and you're sitting in a movie theater, um, it, it overwhelmed me. And I knew right then that I wanted, that's what I want to do. Be a Nazi hunting archeologist. <laughs> no, I want, I want to be a filmmaker, but I didn't even know how that even happened or why, or I didn't even understand it, but I just wanted to be able to do what, what, uh, you know, what that was. So when I was 17, I, a friend of mine, Clark Harris, uh, introduced me to his brother who was making kind of movies. And I started working for him 
uh, you know, did you do the free. typical got VHS camcorders and yeah. The, oh, yeah. made yeah. your own movies? Yeah, as it was a very different. Year old or? Yeah, it was very different then than it was now, of course. You know, we tape. had yeah, exactly tape, and you had to edit on tape, and we had a we had to go to a place that had an editing system. Um, but I entered a, a commercial, a high school commercial, and it took fourth in the nation. So, what was it about? It was about drinking and driving. Mm. It was against it, John, not for it. <laughs> I was going to ask. <laughs> but uh, it was silly and goofy. But I just, you know, I was always writing stories and always, um, uh, you know, always interested in, in, in film as much as possible. So uh, any other favorite standout movies from your teen years? It, we, we had a, uh, uh, you know, we had a VCR and my father had these cables UHF cables and we would be able to trade UHF cables for video rentals. So I'd bike down to the video store and get a, you know, whatever VHS I could and just watch movies and watched a ton of them. But, you know, I was, uh, whatever we could get on VHS that my parents would allow, of course, there were some, you know, titillation movies that I was able to get that were uh, somewhat risque, like, uh, the airplane was one I must have watched a dozen times. The scene with the jello. And oh yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. The pause button <laughs> was definitely <laughs> was definitely utilized as my fifteen year old self. Um, you know, occasionally my parents would rent movies that we shouldn't have watched, and I'd sneak them in the other room, like about last night. I remember, I vividly remember that Rob Lowe. I think it was Demi Moore film about last night. Um, <clears throat> but I watched a lot of movies, watched a lot of television is, you know, for the most part, decent television, never had cable, but, uh, I favorite just, favorite TV shows. Oh, mash, mash, mash and three's company. Even though my parents hated three's company, it was risque. It was quite risque. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I loved mash. It was about and a guy course, who lived with, uh, two girls, right? But yeah. And then he had to fake that he was gay. Right. That was really, yeah. it was a pretty terrible show. You remember soap? Yeah, of Did course. Yeah, Soap? Billy Crystal was a gay character. That's that was right. great. It was the first yeah. openly gay uh -huh. character on TV, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. What did you watch? What were you watching, Delan? You, you can't ask questions. Yes, That's I can. My job. I'm a question asker, too. I watched a ton of TV. So I watched everything. Gilligan's Island, Flintstones, Leave it to Beaver, MASH, you know, Brady Bunch, uh, everything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I watched right. everything. Uh, Dukes of Hazard. Oh, yeah. Fantasy Island. Oh, terrible. Love Boat. Awful. <laughs> I watched everyone. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> There's a TV. We, we don't have cable, but you can get a like an HD antenna, and you can get these really odd channels like coming over the airwaves. And there's this one channel. It's like TV 12 or something, <clears throat> and it plays Love Boat in the middle of the day. And I've been sick, so we seriously just watched Love Boat the other day. A terrible, terrible episode. Terrible. It was terrible. Isaac like saved, solved an Egyptian riddle it was just stupid but i loved it when i was 12 yeah and something that people don't understand now is that there were there were you know back earlier on there was no cable there was right. no vhs there were just like three network channels and then yeah. vhf and <clears throat> and so like for me it was always a big deal when once a year sound of music would come on or mm -hmm. um or smoking the bandit there would be these movies mm -hmm. or the sting yeah, it's a great movie. Every year they would show like the, this movie that you'd wait all year to see. Yeah. Or, or when they showed the Christmas, the Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer or Frosty the Snowman or, you know, when the Grinch stole Christmas or, or Charlie Brown Christmas. Right. So as a kid, you would, you would watch TV Guide. You would, you would pay attention to when that show that you loved every year. Uh -huh. Or, or, or uh, Wizard of Oz. Every year the Wizard mm -hmm. of Oz would come on yeah. one time. Yeah. And so you really it's a wonderful life. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Every Christmas. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. And so you would, you would zone in yeah. and know what time and date, whatever show would, would come on. Yeah. And then in KBYU would show, uh, uh, movies and a lot of musicals. I mean, they ran the hell out of singing in the rain and I must've seen that 15, 20 times when I was a kid. Yeah. Um, and then you'd see old classics. Cause look in the middle of the day, there were, there were four channels, ABC, NBC, CBS, and there wasn't even Fox at that time. No. And, and PBS, basically. And in the day, you had nothing to watch. So you'd rewatch old movies or you'd watch old TV. 
Um, or you just put in a VCR and watch it, you know, watch the same movie three or four times. Or actually, heaven forbid, get on your bike and go build a fort. No, or, yeah, we did that too. To, did a ton of that, man. I was out. We're sounding old. I, was, all the, I know. We are all of a sudden complain. really old. <laughs> I love it. Okay, so you knew you were going to be a filmmaker. You grad. You, you finished your mission, and um, you know what? What was what was next in terms of your career uh, flourishing after post mission? Well, career wise. Um, you know, I got a stupid job at a gas station or something while I, I went to U, UVU. At the time, it was UCC, UVCC, UCC, UVCC. Yeah. Um, and I went there. And, uh, uh, there, you know, there's not many opportunities for, like, you don't just go apply for a job as a filmmaker, especially at that time. There weren't many opportunities. So I uh, did everything I could to um, learn I watched a lot of movies, man. I watched a lot of movies. I've seen so many movies in my life. And I'm one of these guys that I watch movies like I read books. You know, there's some people like, if I'm going to watch a movie, I'm going to begin it and end it. And I'm okay with like 10 minutes, 15 minutes here, 20 minutes here to kind of to be able to finish a movie. And if you want to watch as many movies as I want to watch, that's kind of how you have to do it. Um, but I watched a lot of movies and then I just... I, I became a part of the TV show. There was a TV station at UVCC and we did these like little, you know, news stuff, go out on the streets and find out what's happening and hot in Orem. And we'd edit them together on a VHS to VHS and they'd air throughout the, uh, the throughout the school. So I learned a great deal from that. Um, <clears throat> but then I started to, I went and found a guy who was a filmmaker was doing commercials and I, said, I want to work for you. And I started gripping PA. Tell uh, us what gripping. Well, you know, uh, it would do these film shoots and they were commercials mostly and a, a, a grip or I was a PA. It started as a PA slash grip. And that's basically PA is everything. It's production assistant. You do everything. You move whatever they tell you to move. You go pick up coffee. You do whatever you need to. Um, and a grip is essentially someone who will set the lights, light stands, things of that nature. And then I started working a great deal in film sets. Uh, I was working at other places. I was working up at Sundance and I was working here and there. And eventually I got to the point where, I mean, I was an early 20s kid and you're getting paid 350 bucks a day as a grip. And I was doing films and commercials and the, the state of Utah was blowing up with productions. So you're doing 350 a day. You're working 10 days a month and you're making more than most any of your friends. So I was living up at Sundance in this ratty old house with a bunch of uh, uh, adrenaline junkies, um, you know, just ski bums and dudes. And we were having a great time. There was like six of us in this big old house. And I remember just saying, I'm not going to work anymore. I'm just going to do film. And that was early 20s. And I haven't had a job since. A real job. So around what year is this? God, it was 80. No, that would be 90, 90. Five, mid nineties, mid nineties, and what do you mean? I mean, you're you're basically saying film isn't work. Filmmaking isn't work by saying that. Never gonna no. have a job. Never gonna work again. Well, I Tell mean, us what job, you mean. Job, Tell us what you mean. Like a punch a paycheck. You know, like hired by somebody. Like a full time regular job where nine to five. This is where you go. And I, I you know, I, I I never really took to that. Anyways, again, I, you may be sensing this uh, this kick against structure that I have, but I never really wanted to. Um, be beholden to a, a time clock or somebody else. So the freedom I had by working on film sets and working freelance as a, you know, as a gig employee was really great. And it gave me the opportunity and the <clears throat> time to be able to like write scripts and read books uh, about filmmaking. So no, I never, I never went to film school. Uh, I, I never really, I took a few classes, but I never really went to film school. Sounds like you didn't finish college. No, I didn't. Yeah, you I didn't. just went for this, I didn't. for the career. But I got to say, like, you know, I had a roommate who went to BYU film school. And, like, I remember one day he was watching, like, Battleship Pontankum or something. And I was like, oh, I want to I wanna watch Bull Durham. You know, like, I don't want to watch that. Like, I'd rather watch Caddyshack again. <laughs> um, but, I, I mean, I dare say I read more film books and watched more film films than most anyone I'd ever seen and in working on film sets you know even as a even as a grip to be able to 
to watch directors and I'd watch, you know, we'd have these big directors coming to town and Danny Boyle and I'd work with Kevin Kerslake and these, you know, directors making big, huge movies and to just be able to sit there and watch them work. I mean, what better education was that? And to get paid for it, that was an an amazing education. So I always just kind of learned uh, autodidactically, I suppose. I think that's, that's an amazing way to learn, especially in something like filmmaking. I, I do regret not taking, say, more business classes uh, as a filmmaker. Everyone thinks, you know, the majority of what you do is point and call action and, you know, try and get the best performance out of an actor. The majority of what I do is business. Uh, I, I do, uh, you know, fundraising and grant writing. And, uh, it, you know, it, when you start a film, you are essentially starting a business. Each one is a different business. and You set up a different LLC. So... I wish I'd have taken a few more business classes and I would suggest that to anyone who wants to be a filmmaker is to really hone in on the business skills of it because that is so necessary in today's world. So you lived up at Sundance, mid nineties, you're doing commercials and gripping and, and, you know, assistant producer stuff. Uh, when did your career take its sort of next level? And, or do you want to introduce kind of, things that were happening in your life that paralleled this that might have been important to your journey? Well, I mean, for, go, for, go for a spell, I, uh, about a year and a half, I moved to Dallas with my best friend, Clark. And we moved down there and I got a job at a film studio and I was waiting tables at the same time. Um, this was pre my Sundance years. And uh, uh, I, um, I, we were in a comedy troupe and I was always, comedy was my thing, man, as a child, like stand-up comedy and Monty Python. I mean, I watched the hell out of Monty Python and I watched, um, you know, any kind of wacky comedy I would love. And stand-up, I would just listen to stand-up albums Your over and stand-up over and over. Were I hate who? to say it, but Bill Cosby, man, it's, it's probably not the best person to revere at this point, but man, I'd listen to Bill Cosby over and over and Steve Martin, like I could listen to that uh, Get Small, Get, Get Small album over and over to the where I just Tut. like just in my brain I remember it so about Cheech and Chong no no I mean a little bit Eddie but Murphy that was a little bit yeah man Raw when Raw came out even though Risque boy man that changed everything Richard Raw Pryor was great yeah Richard Pryor's Sunset Strip um you know uh Robin Williams Live at the Met was like I mean, that's like the 1927 Yankees. That is like, <laughs> that is Van Gogh at his best, is that one. So and you I must just, have watched Saturday Night Live oh, early constantly. on. Oh, constantly. I loved yeah. Saturday Night Live. Loved it. Yeah. Loved it. And, you know, since then, I've become obsessed with the early days of Saturday Night Live, every book I've read. And, um, you know, there was a period where I wanted to write for Saturday Night Live, and I really kind of struggled or, or you know, pushed towards that. So I was always writing a lot of comedy. Um, and then I joined this crazy comedy troupe down in Dallas, And I was living down there and I was doing really well and, you know, kind of writing for this comedy troupe and we were performing and doing great stuff. And then one day I, I dropped some acid. (laughs) I was at shrooms. By this time I was kind of, I was, had been leaving the church and experimenting. I was still believing that it was the right thing. But one day I, I took shrooms. Um, and, uh, I mean, to cut a short story short, I just, I, I found myself in the closet, literally, uh, it turned into a bad trip. And anyone who's done mushrooms before, it can be really um, uh, mind opening and mind expansing. And I'd had great, unbelievable experiences with psychedelics, unbelievable experiences, but this one turned really bad. And I found myself by the end of the night having a really bad trip and in my closet literally praying to a God that I hadn't prayed to in a while and just asking like, what am I supposed to do? What am I supposed to do with life? And, uh, uh, I can't believe I'm telling you this. You're like some kind of therapist or something, aren't you? (laughs) Um, I remember just like getting this feeling of like, my father is a good man. My dad was a really good, just funny, loving, everybody loved my father and he took care of his kids and he always had time for us. I have no idea now how he had time for seven kids, but, and a wife and a church and a job and a house, but he seemed, he was always there. And I just thought, you know, I gotta, I gotta be a better person to be a better father. And so just like that, I thought I gotta go back to Utah. And so I quit, I quit the comedy troupe. I quit my job 
and I packed up my stuff and moved back here to the uh, back to Utah. And that's when I then started uh, doing gripping and things of that nature. Did so. that revitalize your Mormonism? That that bad trip. Um, a little bit. Yeah, it did. I came back and I came back to Utah. And of course I came back and I was initially living with my parents. So I was going to a singles ward and, uh, uh, the singles ward was, you know, it was a unique, uh, many people have probably been to singles wards. Uh, and I remember going and I, I remember like trying to get back into it. And at the time I was dating a, a young woman who wanted me to get back into the church. Nothing drives motivation like a pretty girl telling you what you want what she wants so yeah I started to get back into it and uh I remember going in to the bishop and I said I gotta repent for this stuff and of course I'd been drinking and I'd been fooling around and uh I uh had been drinking coffee actually I, I didn't start drinking coffee till my 30s but uh I remember sitting down and you know, you're in a you're in this bishop's office, and uh, there was a dude who was the bishop was a brand new bishop, and he was like, "Well, what's troubling you? What's your what's happening?" And I remember I just like laid it out, like I've done this, I did this, I'm doing this, I've done this, I've this, that, and the other, just this laundry list of quote unquote sins, and I remember just regaling him with this. And he just sat there dumbstruck. Like he literally just like, he didn't, he didn't know what to say. He didn't know what, I, I could see on his face, like most people just say they, you know, watch R-rated movies. Or, and I just, he didn't know what to do or what to say. And he just goes, he goes, well, have you read, have you prayed and read your scriptures? And I just thought, you know, like I'm coming to you with these things. He's a dentist for one, like he's not even, He's not someone who is used to hearing these stories, and he's not someone who is trained in any way to help me or to tell me. So he's like, you need to pray and read your scriptures. And then he goes, and then we're going to need to get a court together to decide if you're you know, worthy to be a part of it. And I remember just at that moment thinking, like, why am I, if I'm having issues with who I am and some of the things I do, why am I telling a dentist like, why am I telling this guy and why is he going to get a bunch of a dentist and an accountant and a, someone else to decide whether I should be a part of this club? And so I left. I left the, left the building and I never went back. That was it. That was, I mean, you know, I still didn't have the antithesis uh, or, you know, the, I didn't really have the faith disarming moment, but that was the thing where I just like, why am I, if I need to work on myself, and if I'm in a place where I'm not comfortable with who I am, I don't think this is the environment that will make me a better person. And that was one of those moments that was honestly like a life-changing period for me. I remember like walking out of there almost almost floating, just going like, I can take care of myself. I can fix myself. And obviously I needed some kind of clarity at that point. I needed a little, you know, push in the right direction. But I knew that that wasn't where I was going to get it. And did you process that as the church isn't true or the, the church just isn't working for me, but it's still true or question mark about the church's truth? No, I never, there was no like the church isn't true. I didn't, I didn't even, I, for all I knew it was, but just what I knew working. it wasn't for me. Yeah. It just wasn't for me. And honestly, I always felt, I always felt like I was worse in it. Like I always felt like I was never doing enough. Like I was never good enough. I was never going to church enough. And I was always feeling guilty and bad for the way I was doing. And I was a good kid, man. When I was in high school, I was a good kid. But if my football team lost, it was because I, you know, spent too long looking at my sister's L magazine. You know, it was because I, I had bad thoughts that I got a C minus on that paper. And that, you know, that kind of, uh, that kind of thoughts really were, was limiting to me. And it wasn't until I realized that I'm okay and I'll fix myself and uh, the cause and effect of me doing quote unquote bad things uh, doesn't really add up. It wasn't until I, I realized that, that I was able to really grow on my own. And of course I was mid to late twenties, which is when you kind of do your growing anyways. 
Okay, so you have this moment where you decide the church isn't for you. How did how did your film career advance after that point? <laughs> um, how many years was it between then and uh, Sons of Perdition coming out? Quite a few years. I uh, I was still gripping. I was still working on other people's film sets. And then one day I just, uh, I read a great book called uh, uh, Feature Filmmaking on a Used Car Budget. And it's Rick Schmidt. And I read it and it was basically, you know, make a film for nothing. You know, just do it. Just put together, you know, and this was quite a, now it's quite commonplace, but this was a very bold endeavor in the late 90s to be able to say, just make a movie. Just go out and find a way to make a movie. Kind of pre-Blair Witch Project. Totally. Right? You know, and now you can. You can make a movie. Hell, you're making a movie right now. You got cameras. <laughs> when is the Mormon Stories movie coming out, John Lynn? We're hiring you for that. Is it? That's yeah. going to be a good one. We're Blockbuster. <laughs> um, so I made a short film. I made a short film called Modern Miracles. And it was very much rooted in faith in many ways. It's about a, it's a comedy, a wacky comedy about a, kid from a small town who goes to a big city and automatic doors open and he believes he has some power like he's imbued with this special power and so he becomes this prophetic individual who goes throughout towns and opens doors for individuals and you know it was very kind of based upon my faith I mean that was my first film other than the stuff I'd done in Dallas the comedy videos um, and it did well it played all over it played at festivals and it got me commercial work as a commercial director. So I started uh, directing commercials. Um, and so next thing you know, I was a kid moving lights. And then literally like the next day, I was in charge of the film sets, doing big, uh, big commercials for technology companies all over the country. Yeah, and I've heard that, I've heard the commercials are the most, you know, it's like, commercials, TV commercials, and then it's like TV shows, and then it's movies, and then it's kind of radio, like mu 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 you know, musicians. But the, but the TV commercials are a great way to make good money. Oh, of course. And it, you can, uh, you know, unlike a movie, which takes years to make, you can do a commercial in, in a month, you can make a decent amount of money. I, I think it's a little different now. Back then, there was a great deal more commercials and industrials and uh, corporate pieces now there still is but the budgets aren't the same but still I, I i do remember and by this time i'd found a wonderful woman uh and uh we were living together amelia and uh we'd had a lovely wonderful boy and i remember one day like being on set and i just remember having this like bolt of 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 a flashback moment of uh, my first day when I was filming. And, uh, you know, I remember like we were filming my short, short film and I'd put a crew together and I'd raise some money and I'd had everyone work for free and we shot on film. And I remember being like in this farm and it was, sun was going down and my friends were with me and just this like, this is exactly what I want to do. And while I was making this big grocery store commercial, I remember like, oh, I might, this isn't what I want to do. This isn't, I don't want to make commercials anymore. Um, and I was enjoying the money. <laughs> and I'd made a couple of really great short films. Um, after that, I made one called Fall of Man, which again was very faith-based. Uh, now about, that's the first in your IMDb. So the first oh, thing you it? mentioned isn't in your IMDb. No, I mean, that's, I, that's, I could probably put it in there. But, but Fall of Man is your first... Fall of Man is a, is a, a really short. great film, and I raised some money for it. It's shot it on 35 millimeter, got a good crew. Um, it's about a guy who meets Satan in the desert. <laughs> and uh, Satan tries to convince this marketing executive to uh, run his campaign, to market Satan because Satan's had a bad name. Um, and it's, you know, it's this fun little dialogue based thing as they walk through the desert. Is it on the internet somewhere? I don't know. Like Maybe. YouTube? Have you uploaded these to YouTube? Uh, it might be on there. It's, I've never heard of YouTube. What is that? <laughs> um, it's probably on there somewhere. Um, but you know, it right, was... I, I want listeners to, to look that up right <laughs> now and if, uh, or our producers, and if you can find it on YouTube, paste a link to it. Um, and Cody will include it in the show notes. Well, I can probably 
put it somewhere. Okay. If it, I think it is on YouTube somewhere. And it's a great film. It's a really great film. Uh, a friend of mine, Sean Rapier, and I wrote it. It's funny. It's well acted. It's well put together. And it played at festivals all over the country, all over the world. Did really well. And then I made another short film called The Furniture about a man who believes uh, that his furniture is trying to kill him. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, that's the third and like another kind of faith-based piece dealing in death. So I kind of, as you know, the rest of my work also follows a very faith and um, a belief and deceit uh, theme. Um, and, and so one day I just said, I'm not going to do commercials anymore. And I decided I was going to make a film. And I produced with my wonderful uh, friend and partner, Charles Oliver, a film called Take. Uh, and that uh, starred Minnie Driver and Jeremy Renner. And he directed it. That's and Mindy Driver. That's a big name. Yeah. She was in Goodwill Hunting. Right. And Jeremy Renner is a huge name. Yeah, yeah. And he's Hawkeye. Which one? Who's he? Oh, Hawkeye. Yeah, right. Nobody remembers We've talked about Jared. this. Dude's We've got an Academy about. Award. He's one of the Avengers. Yeah, he's, yeah, he's he was Hurt Locker. He won an Academy Award for Hurt Locker. Right. This was early Jeremy Renner. One of the nicest guys I've ever met in my life. Just, just. Like just a dude who would hang out with the crew and him and I got along well. We traveled to festivals here and there. We had a great time. You told me his name before and I still don't remember him. I know. That's and I love thing. the Avengers that I don't remember. And Jeremy Renner's like this. He was in Wind River, that film that was shot here love in Utah. Love that. Love that movie. <laughs> he's so talented and nobody really, he's kind of like that, you know, very talented guy. So that that's cool you were part of their, so were you Mini Driver before Goodwill Hunting then? No, or? it was post. It was post. Oh, Goodwill wow. Hunting. So yeah. that's a big deal. I mean, it was, it was a low What budget. was it like to have a movie with, with like a star? Well, I was just a producer, so I didn't, okay. you know, but it was, it was nice to go out of the gate. Uh, it was a $1.5 million film and I helped uh, put it together and package it and helped raise a lot of money uh, for the film and it, uh, it played at Tribeca. Uh, Showtime picked it up. It had a nice theatrical run, so it did okay. Okay, I have to ask you something that you're not probably prepared to talk about, and you can tell me you don't want to talk about it. I Obviously, I have no so, secrets here, John. So we're around 2007 with Take. This was around the time where Mormon cinema was kind of really taking off. So Richard Dutcher's right. uh, God's Army uh, came out around maybe a few years before this, and then there was like Singles Ward and you know, church ball and then, you know, the follow on to God's army, uh, States of grace. What was it right. called? Something like, like that. He did uh, States of grace and he did Brigham city and then Brigham city. So what, how did you observe that phenomenon that was emerging Mormon cinema? I was in the heart of it. I was, I had an office in Provo. I was living in Provo. Um, I, I, we'd was had this Hail office storm Hailstorm actually did the post-production of singles ward in our office. Okay. So I would, I would see these films and I would work alongside it and you, I, it was a big deal. It was like this, everyone was making Mormon movies. Um, and I was offered to direct one that was uh, eventually directed, uh, by Christian Voiza. I can't remember what it was called. Like the, I can't remember. But they asked me to direct it, and I wanted to change some things, so I said no because I it was like too overly Mormon, and I wanted to like make it not. So I wanted to expand it a little bit. Like they're like everyone was like, let's just make this movie for more Mormons, and I was like, let's think a little bigger. Let's there's a big old world outside of these walls, um, and I wanted to expand that script, and they didn't like it, so he went and did it. I was uh, asked to do a film that honestly was just done. Uh, it was called Track. And it was just done by Alan Peterson. I mean, this was 15 years ago or more, many more years ago, 20 years ago when he had that concept and idea. And it just didn't, like, it just didn't sing to me. I just didn't want to, I didn't want to do Mormon movies. How were you enjoying those Mormon movies? Were you like, this is schlock, this is great? Like, at the time, you weren't believing anymore. And so that must have been interesting for you to see those movies that are so catering to a believing Mormon audience. You know, I thought some of them were actually really good. I mean, Singles Ward was a groundbreaking, I don't care who you are, it's a funny film. And Kurt Hale is a, one of the, he's such a great guy. He's such a solid dude. Um, and, it, you know, it was, it was groundbreaking. It really was. I mean, there's a saying in the film world, especially in the documentary world, find your niche and you'll get rich. Uh, rich might be, you know, too, too big of a term, but... Uh, they found their niche. They knew exactly what they were going for. They knew exactly who they catered to. And it was brilliant. And it was wise. And they made good movies. You know, I think it slipped. And then everyone started to do it. And everyone was making movies. And a lot of people who probably shouldn't have been <clears throat> directing films uh, were making films. So, uh, you know, look, making a movie, man, it's hard. 
it is work and it's difficult and exhausting and tiring and it takes time, effort, energy, and passion. And anyone who makes one, my hat's off to them. Like no matter it, what the subject. No matter what. It's so hard. Honestly, it's so hard. I Kudos to each of them for doing it. Any... Did you have any observations on Richard Dutcher's career as it kind of rose and fell? And I don't mean to get personal, but just like any, did you have any observations? No, not necessarily. Uh, you know, I'd never really seen his movies uh, until a few years later. Uh, I never had met him. Uh, Richard and I are actually really good friends right now. We're actually pretty close. Uh, he's a big baseball and Cubs fan like I am. We go to baseball games. We hang out. We talk about movies. Uh, he's actually a really good guy. And... Um, I mean, we had a spell. There was a period where we didn't get along, but we're good friends. So, no, I, I you know, he, he, again, he is an independent filmmaker. Dude makes movies. Like, I just, and he continue, he, he, there's a handful of people that I know in this state that just make movies. Like, they just make movies, and that's it. Uh, you know, there's people who, you know, you know, do a lot of commercials or industrials and, they, that's how they make their living and they want to make movies or every once in a while they make one. But there's a, just a few people who just make films and are able to just make films. I'm so fortunate that I'm one of them. But Dutch is another one. Richard Dutcher just writes scripts. He just make movies. And when he was a kid and wanted to make movies, by God, that's what he's doing. When I was 10 years old, I want to make movies. That's what I'm doing. How many people can say that they're doing what they want to do when they were 10 years old? So grateful this will tie into our uh really exciting announcement at the end of this episode but did you you know were you cognizant of the rumors that dutcher was going to make the joseph smith biography oh yeah at the yeah, time yeah. you know that was talked about yeah um were you looking forward to that you know yeah look that that uh that idea has been bantied about for years uh there was a rumor and how founded it was i don't know that uh Robert Redford and Paul Newman were going to play Brigham Young and Joseph Smith. Now, that's would have been great. Uh, you know, and every, a lot of people have tried to do it, and I know that Richard tried to do it, and maybe one day he will or somebody will. It's a hell of a story. Yeah. I, I mean, we were all rooting for him at the time, and yeah. then it didn't happen. You know, making movies is hard, man. Getting money and putting something together is not easy. So I don't, I don't know necessarily what happened, but it'd be interesting to see. We do, we do have an interview with Richard Dutcher on Mormon Stories where you can hear all about that kind of stuff. So check that out. Google Mormon Stories, Richard Dutcher. <laughs>